Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. This episode of Forgotten History is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new kind of streaming service aiming to bring you the best documentaries from around the world. On today's episode, the History Guy discusses the history of several naturally occurring resources. The mineral asbestos, with its reputation as a hazardous material, and helium, one of the universe's most abundant elements. Both have surprising and interesting histories that intertwine with humanity. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. In 1886, English scientist Norman Lockyer was using a relatively new device that was called a spectroscope, which studies properties of matter based on visible light that is dispersed along a spectrum according to its wavelength by a prism. Looking at a spectrum that was observed towards the edge of the sun or along its corona, he noticed in the spectrum a bright spot that indicated the presence of an element that had a wavelength that was similar to sodium. Suspecting that he identified a brand new heretofore undiscovered solar element, he named it after the Greek name for the sun, Helios, and thus, for the first time in human history, identified what humans had never before seen, the second most abundant element in the known universe, helium. And that noble gas would change history. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Helium is the second lightest and second most abundant element in the observable universe, only behind hydrogen, making up approximately 23% of the universe's baryonic mass, that is, the mass made up by normal matter as opposed to dark matter. The gas has applications both because it is naturally inert and non-reactive, and because it can be cooled to a very cold state without freezing. In fact, it won't freeze to a solid under normal pressure, instead becoming superfluid, making it both industrially important for cryogenics and a valuable tool in studying quantum mechanics. Scientists theorize that most of the universe's helium was created by the so-called Big Bang, but it is also created inside stars, where by a complex process called the proton-to-proton chain, hydrogen atoms are fused into helium-4. As helium-4 has lower mass than the four hydrogen atoms that created it, energy is released by Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared. As there are a massive amount of hydrogen atoms being fused, this process creates a massive amount of energy, some of which escapes the star. In short, the process of fusion powers the sun, and then the earth, while at the same time, producing helium. But the helium produced in the sun is not what we use to fill party balloons here on earth. In the earth's atmosphere, the concentration of helium by volume is just 5.2 parts per million, too little for extraction to be practical. That is because helium is able to escape Earth's atmosphere via a number of processes, in essence bleeding into space. Unlike a gas giant like Jupiter, where the great mass of the planet and the extreme cold temperatures allow it to hold on to much of its helium and hydrogen. So where do we get helium? To understand that, we have to go back in scientific history. Luigi Palmieri was an Italian physicist who, in 1847, became chair of the physics department at the University of Naples. He was doing work with the Vesuvius Observatory, which had been founded in 1841 on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius to study the volcano that had famously destroyed the Roman city of Pompeii in an eruption in 79 AD. The observatory is the oldest volcanology institute in the world. In the course of his work there, he made improvements to a number of scientific instruments, including the seismometer, the Morse telegraph, and the meteorological instruments, the anemometer, which measures wind, and the pluviometer, which measures rain. In 1881, Palmieri was studying a process that occurs in extraordinary conditions, like volcanoes, called sublimation, where a substance transitions directly from a solid to a gas without going through an intermediate liquid phase. Palmieri was using a spectroscope to determine exactly what substances were being subliminated, and among his findings was a surprise. That bright yellow spot of a wavelength 587.49 nanometers that had only before been observed in the corona of the sun. In studying volcanoes, Palmieri had made an astounding discovery. Helium, thought only to occur in the sun, occurred naturally on Earth, 
and could be trapped in minerals. While Palmieri's discovery was intriguing, it did not explain what this mysterious element was, nor how it was trapped or released. That discovery also occurred by accident. John William Strutt, the third Baron Rayleigh, was a British scientist who made a number of different important contributions to science, including providing a theoretical understanding of the process of elastic scattering of light by particles that explains why the sky is blue during the day and reddens at sunset. That process is called Rayleigh scattering. In 1894, Rayleigh gave a lecture that was attended by a Scottish chemist named William Ramsey. In the lecture, Rayleigh mentioned that he had noticed a discrepancy between the density of nitrogen made by chemical synthesis and nitrogen isolated from the air by removal of other known components. Rayleigh theorized that the nitrogen extracted from air was mixed with another unknown gas. The two decided to investigate the discrepancy, and in August of that year, Ramsey isolated what he described as a new heavy component of air, which, curiously, did not appear to have any chemical reactivity. He named the inert gas argon, from the Greek word meaning lazy. What Ramsey and Rayleigh had discovered were, in fact, the noble gases, a group of six chemical elements that have similar properties that includes neon, argon, krypton, xenon, the radioactive radon, and, of course, helium. The six noble gases are all odorless, colorless, monatomic, meaning the atoms are not bound to each other, gases, with very low chemical reactivity. The inertness of noble gases make them very suitable in applications where reactions are not wanted, and they have a number of scientific and practical applications. For their discovery, Rayleigh was awarded the 1904 Nobel Prize in Physics, and Ramsey was awarded the 1904 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. In 1895, Ramsey was searching for argon by applying sulfuric acid to the mineral clevite, an impure radioactive variety of uraninite, which has a high concentration of rare earth elements. When he applied the acid and used a spectroscope, he saw the characteristic bright yellow line indicating helium. The same year, Per Theodor Cleve, the Swedish mineralogist after whom clevite was named, was able to independently isolate helium from a sample of clevite and collect enough of the gas to determine its atomic weight. In fact, helium is found in large amounts in minerals including clevite, uraninite, carnitite, and monazite, minerals of uranium and thorium. But exactly how and why these minerals contain helium was still a mystery until New Zealand-born physicist Ernest Rutherford studied the nature of radioactivity. Radioactivity had first been discovered by French scientist Henri Becquerel, who shared a Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of spontaneous radiation with Pierre and Marie Curie. Radioactive decay is a process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by emitting radiation such as an alpha particle. The discovery transformed scientific understanding into the nature of matter and resulted in practical applications such as the use of radiation therapy to treat cancer. Among their contributions, the Curies discovered the radioactive element, radium. Ernest Rutherford, largely known as the father of nuclear physics, was the first to realize that all such elements decay in accordance with the same mathematical exponential formula, the concept of a radioactive half-life. He also identified the element radon, a radioactive substance that is one of the noble gases, and differentiated alpha and beta particles. For his work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. Rutherford and his student English radiochemist Frederick Soddy were the first to realize that the anomalous behavior of radioactive elements was because they decayed into other elements. In 1903, working with William Ramsey, Soddy showed that the decay of radium produced helium gas. For his work on the chemistry of radioactive substances, Soddy received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1921. In 1907, Rutherford bombarded the thin glass wall of an evacuated tube with alpha particles to study the spectrum of the new gas inside. There he discovered that alpha particles, named after the first letter of the Greek alphabet, were actually helium nuclei. When those nuclei, which were at this point an ion because they had a net electrical charge, pick up electrons in the environment, they become natural helium atoms. In 1917, Danish physicist Niels Bohr, another student of Rutherford, looked at lines in the spectrum called the Pickering-Fowler spectrum and determined that they were not, as previously suggested, a new form of hydrogen, but instead were ionized helium. The discovery changed the nature of the understanding of the atom leading to what is called the Bohr model, which theorized that an atom is a system consisting of a small, dense nucleus surrounded by revolving electrons. While the model is now so greatly refined that it is said to be superseded by the valence shell model of the atom and quantum physics, 
the Bohr model, integrally connected to the discovery of terrestrial helium, is still the most common way that the nature of the atom is described, and familiar to virtually everyone who took middle school chemistry. For his work, Bohr was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922. Thus, helium is a central part of the story of the history of modern science. It was critical to the development and design of the periodic table of elements, the discovery of radiation, the foundation of quantum mechanics, our understanding of the very nature of matter itself. You have helium to thank or to blame for what you either enjoyed or suffered through, depending upon your perspective, for much of your middle school and high school science class. And yet all these Nobel laureates had yet to produce enough helium to fill a single balloon. The story of how we fill a helium balloon starts in Dexter, Kansas in 1903. The some 400 residents of Dexter in far southern Cowley County were understandably excited at the discovery of a howling geyser of natural gas. While natural gas was not yet recognized as the home heating and electrical generation source that it is today, excited Kansans still envisioned the well as a source of new industries, such as ore smelters and brick and glass plants that would revolutionize the area economy. The people of Dexter planned a large celebration, including a brass band. The gas was still escaping, the drilling company hadn't gotten the equipment yet to cap it, and the celebration was to be spectacularly capped off by the mayor lighting the escaping gas which was supposed to produce, as flyers at the time said, a great pillar of flame from the burning well, which will light the entire countryside for a day and a night. But when they tried to light the fire using a burning bale of hay, to the crowd's disappointment, it refused to light. Well, this disappointment for the people of Dexter, who saw their dreams of new prosperity decidedly refuse to go up in flames, it intrigued a man named Erasmus Hayworth, the Kansas State geologist. He took a sample of the gas to the University of Kansas, where with the help of chemistry professor David F. McFarland, they went to solve the puzzle of the gas that wouldn't burn. The answer was that the well only produced 15% combustible methane, which would not burn in the presence of almost 72% non-flammable nitrogen. But more interestingly, the sample contained some 12% unidentifiable inert gases. McFarland and a colleague, Hamilton P. Cady, further refined the gas with a complex process and found, to their astonishment, that the well gas was 1.84% helium. Cady and McFarland then investigated gas wells throughout Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. In 1906, they reported, a very unusual opportunity for obtaining helium in practically unlimited quantities. When their findings were published in November 1907, Cayley commented that their work determined that supplies of helium in natural gas in the American Great Plains assures the fact that helium is no longer a rare element, but a common element existing in good quantity for uses that are yet to be found for it. No one really had a good use for helium yet, but suddenly they had a source for it. Terrestrial helium is the result of radioactive decay of minerals of uranium and thorium, whose unstable atoms emit alpha particles helium nuclei, which then collect electrons and become helium. The helium accumulates and is trapped or occluded within the mineral. In this way, an estimated 3,000 metric tons of helium are generated per year throughout the Earth's crust. But that means that helium is a non-renewable resource. There are finite quantities of these minerals. What's more, helium has the lowest boiling point of all the elements, and as mentioned earlier, is the second lightest of the elements. When helium is released into the atmosphere, it quickly turns to gas and escapes losing that non-renewable resource forever. Because helium is trapped in the subsurface under conditions that also trap natural gas, the greatest natural concentrations of helium on the planet are found in natural gas under places like Dexter, Kansas. And it is from there that most commercial helium is extracted. The U.S. Navy built three experimental plants to refine helium from natural gas during World War I for the use of non-flammable lifting gas for barrage balloons. Although a more efficient process would later be devised, the Navy plants produced some 200,000 cubic feet of helium during the war. That was an astounding amount, as previously, less than a single cubic meter of helium had been obtained in all of world history. The Helium Act of 1925 created the National Helium Reserve, northwest of Amarillo, Texas, in a natural geologic gas storage formation, the Bush Dome Reservoir. At the time, the U.S. had a virtual monopoly on the gas, which was used to fill naval airships. Seen as a key strategic material, the act banned export of the gas, which the nation could hardly produce in enough quantity to fill its military airships. 
That scarcity was one of the reasons that the Zeppelin Hindenburg was filled with more cheaply obtained but highly flammable hydrogen as its lifting gas, with disastrous results. Helium-filled blimps were used for submarine patrols during the Second World War, where the Allies had a monopoly on the gas. However, it played at least one more role because of its unique characteristics. Helium was used in a special mass spectrometer used to detect small leaks. The helium mass spectrometer was a critical tool used in the Manhattan Project and the development of atomic weapons. After the war, the unique properties of liquid helium made it an important coolant for rocket fuel and other strategic uses during the Cold War, and the U.S. government continued its virtual monopoly. Amendments to the Helium Act in 1960 funded the creation of plants to refine helium from natural gas and ship it via pipeline to the Strategic Reserve. But by the mid-90s, the helium reserve had over a billion cubic meters of the gas and had racked up $1.4 billion in debt. There were greater private demands for the gas, which many applications in industry and scientific research. In 1996, the U.S. decided to sell off the gas with the Helium Privatization Act. The reserve to be, was to be sold in order to pay off the debt acquired by creating it. You might have heard recently about a helium shortage and price shocks. The government was criticized for its process of pricing helium, which sold off the helium from the reserve well below market prices, and that discouraged conservation and the development of new sources. As the gas in the reserve started to go away, then the government had to raise prices in order to get enough money to pay off the reserve's outstanding debt. Meanwhile, other new sources, like a plant that was being built in Wyoming, didn't come online as quickly as some people thought that they would, and other new sources in the Middle East and Africa were disrupted due to political instability. The price shocks, and according to the New York Times, there have been three major helium shortages in the past 14 years, threaten a number of industries that use helium for leak detection, scuba diving, medical therapy, and of course, balloons, including the ones in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Helium, because the inert gas can be chilled to almost absolute zero, is also essential for a number of scientific applications, including the Large Hadron Collider. But its largest use is not science or balloons, but as a coolant for the magnets in Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or MRI, machines. Without helium, the machines wear out very quickly. Now, 23 years after having decided to sell off its helium reserve, there is a new Helium Conservation Act that has been moving through Congress, although there's been some difficulty getting it passed. And some scientists argue that frivolous uses like party balloons should be limited. Still, most helium that is actually extracted today is never refined out. It's considered a, a useless industrial byproduct. And estimates of newly found reserves suggest that the helium reserves in the Earth are far larger than once thought, if only we'll make the effort to collect them. And so there's a very good chance that the gas that was so important to the history of science will continue to lift us into the future. Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy, a little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff that you only get to hear about on the podcast. We're really fortunate on this podcast episode to be able to have our grand, my grandmother, the history guy's mom, on as well, just like we did last time. So we're really excited to have her as a guest. And I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you guys. This is interesting. So today we're talking about asbestos and helium, which are two really kind of interesting, very different, but both natural kind of things that we find on the planet, natural resources, and that have had rather large effects on human history. I mean, they're kind of, you know, off sort of topics, uh, but, uh, but uh, they both had really surprising things about them. And that's one of the fun things that we can do is go find out the, the history of things you never even thought about their history. Uh, and they both had some real surprises as we went to, to discover their history. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's part of the fun of, of being a history guy. Yeah, the first one, the first episode that we just listened to is on helium. I think, I mean, the obvious irony that helium is one of the most abundant elements in the universe. Second most and, abundant element in the universe, yes. And we didn't, we didn't even discover it really until very, very recently. Yeah, really, uh, in the 19th century, before we even knew it existed and had no idea it existed on Earth. And the reason it has the name helium is because without it only existed in the sun. It's a really, it's just, that's a really interesting story that in itself, and especially because something that we didn't know existed and which is only could find in the sun and now we use it to float party balloons. 
<laughs> and realize that we have a large supply, but that it's actually uh, that it's a, a, a finite supply here on Earth. And that it was all a very interesting story, both from how they originally identified it and how they came, and then that helped to identify the noble gases. Uh, and then one day, some starts coming out of a geyser there in Kansas, and we find out that we have it, and then it's a strategic supply. One of the reasons that the Hindenburg blew up is because we would not share our helium, although there's, there's other reasons why helium was a little different to use. It's all just a very, very interesting story. You know, that started out with me at the dollar store, I swear, uh, and the guy in front of the dollar, the, at the dollar store was explaining why they didn't have helium for party balloons for a while, because we have periodic shortages of helium, and that's what got me to go research it, and it turned out to be a very interesting topic. It's interesting because it's such an important, it's it's so important to so many like heavy, heavy industry and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And yet apparently we, based on the history, we don't, we still don't necessarily we still uh, treat don't. it we, with respect. We pump out a lot of natural gas where we could refine helium from it that we don't. That helium, when it escapes, it's uh, because it's so light, it, it, that literally leaves the atmosphere and it's gone forever. So we are wasting helium that we might someday need. Uh, and there's only so much of it on Earth, though maybe more than we realized. I think that oh, one of the things that's really cool about the, both of these episodes is that they, and especially this helium one, is that they both have a fairly significant crossover with science. Absolutely, yeah. I, and I think that speaks, I mean, to both of us uh, for our shared interest in science, even though, as we say, we're emphatically not, emphatically not, not scientists. scientists. <laughs> I do, we do our best to explain stuff. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you about kind of where does your interest in science stem from? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm just interested in learning, I think is where it goes. I mean, I'm truly not a scientist. A lot of this does go over my head, but that the fun part of this is that I get to go learn it in a way that I can explain it to somebody else. And very often when we do these these high tech topics and we have people say, oh, you know, this is my expertise and you really made sense of it. But the, this is not a technical channel. It's not intended to be a technical channel. And that's the way that we can take and kind of translate it to, you know, people like me. I'm a historian, but I'm trying to figure out this history of science. So uh, to me, it is a combination though. I'm, I, I, I've never Never really tended towards the sciences. It's the it's the history of science that is so interesting, uh, and so and, you know in both of these you see how many important scientists were involved in the in the helium one. There's just Nobel Prize after Nobel Prize after Nobel Prize. Uh, our whole understanding of the atom you know develops from this identification of helium. That's just a lot of fun. The history of science is as exciting as the history of anything. And I know that uh, I know that Grandma has had quite a bit to do with science, although her degree uh, was originally in music. Yes, um, matter of fact, I uh, I graduated from. Western State College at Gunnison, Colorado, with a degree in opera, <laughs> uh, which uh, uh, I never really used. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, then it got me into uh, into the computer world, into that scientific thing, because most people don't realize this, but uh, the kind of mind that uh, writes music, because music is math, is also the so same type of person that um, that will program computers. You will do exactly the same. You use the same kind of of energy and the same t thought. And so uh, I'm not a scientist either, obviously, but I've spent a lot of my life then around the science of f producing food. Uh, as a matter of fact, grandma's in the cattle business. It's it's funny that this this little place in Kansas, Dexter, mm -hmm. is the center mm -hmm. of, it's where we discovered that we had helium. Yeah. It's a town of, I, I checked it and it's still, Fewer than 300 people mm -hmm. Fewer than 300 are living people, in Dexter. Yeah. They got a geyser makes... that they imagined was natural gas. Turned out it was uh, not mostly natural gas, but it had a surprising amount of helium in it, more than anybody would have thought possible. And that's what put them onto the idea that maybe there's a lot more helium under there than we realize. And, and the original process for refining that helium, too, uh, develops out of Dexter there. And then they go research all the way across you know, the, the, the middle United States and find out that it's actually a significant part of all these gas wells. Yeah, that's an interesting. We didn't we didn't know that we couldn't. Well, if it was in smaller, much smaller amounts, it'd be harder to find if it was in that, you know, especially if you're looking for natural we're gas, to, you know, yeah, we're talking necessarily care. Three percent or something like that. But even that is yeah. still it's a massive percent compared to what they, I mean, there went a point where they had the, the, the entirety of, of the human existence. They had produced maybe a square meter of, of helium that they had used for experiments. And now suddenly we could fill, you know, blimps with them. Yeah. Uh, although for you know a long time it was a shortage. I mean we had to reuse the helium so that uh, that literally if we were blowing up one of our blimps we'd have to take the helium out of another blimp. So when we had these original large zeppelins that crossed the United States that were important, you know the the the, the Akron and the Shenandoah and the uh, uh, and the Macon uh, and the Los Angeles, those four we we didn't have enough helium to fill all four of them. So that was one of the reasons that we wouldn't give say helium to the Germans, and so they had hydrogen and hydrogen explodes. Yeah, even after the Hindenburg, because I'm actually doing a, doing some research that's related to this at the moment, uh, 
the the guy who had d designed it, Zeppelin, uh, did not want to use hydrogen anymore after the Hindenburg exploded. And but he couldn't. They didn't have access to any. They couldn't get the helium from the U.S. He came here and tried to lobby us for it, but we couldn't have flown our own Zeppelins without it. Yeah, and we and we actually maintained that monopoly well into the Cold War because it has a lot of yeah. rocket applications, and and we really wanted to try to keep the world supply, so that we were even storing helium, but we weren't sharing helium. Uh, and uh, you know that the strategic reserve is gone, and that sort of it's kind of changed since. But uh, yeah, that we we thought of helium as a, as a national strategic resource for a very long time. And to some extent, it still is because of its importance in uh, its importance in scientific applications. Well, you see, you know, the super collider superconductors, these huge machines, they require helium, uh, and uh, and th those can be very important to research. And they're also uh, extremely important in the use of the MRI machine. Uh, and so there still can be, so, I mean, there are people arguing that we shouldn't be using this in party balloons. Yeah, and for, you know, making high voices, <laughs> which I think would be most people's connection to uh, to helium is thinking about those, those, those two things. Um, I also I also kind of wanted to talk about, you know, while we're here right after Thanksgiving, I thought it would be a good time for us to talk about that. We're just thankful for our, our ability to be in the position that we're in and to teach people and to talk to people about history, which I think has been I mean, for me, this is a dream come true. And I, I try to I try to emphasize that is that this is I've I've always been a writer. I've always been someone who I, I'd be researching most of this stuff, you know, just in my free time and the ability to tell other people about it and to let people learn from us has been it's it's been humbling it is i i am so grateful so thankful for the for the job i mean this wasn't a job when i graduated you know college but for years i would just talk about history and people said to me you should you should you know do that for a living and i had no idea how to do that for a living and so this is uh, offers the podcast and youtube and and all the social media channels have offered us this opportunity to do it for a living and share our passion with people who share it back and and to be successful at it and yes very very thankful uh that's one of the great things to be thankful for is that this is we get to study things we like to study and share it with people and and we get a lot of people who come back and say that it's meaningful to them and that's that's a great job to have but that's also a part of the family because our family goes back to uh, uh, grand my grandfather would uh, would tell the stories about Billy the kid he knew Pat Garrett actually when he was a young man and Pat was old and he told stories and he'd cry and wipe his glasses and then my father Harold Bradford did the same thing and would who would you believe then here we sit with Lance and then and here we sit with Josh we're all storytellers I think that that's I think that that's what if there's anything that I feel like is is special about what we do is it's it's that storytelling mm -hmm. that's uh, I mean I, I love what the the education and but I think that primarily we try to tell stories I think that's always been the focus and yeah I think that that's something I honestly even more than history something I enjoy yeah. and I like being able to to make stories out of history. Yeah, and uh, these episodes, I really say something about that because there is a story to the to helium, a story uh, to uh, to asbestos. That's not something you would have thought of as those being a story, no. and yet you can tell a really compelling story about its its past, its present, and future, and and tell it in a way that gives you you know messages for for what goes forward. So that is that it's extremely fun to be able to be a storyteller and have people appreciate that. Yeah, and it it really is just incredible to think that helium, which most people I think the only things we think of it with are kind of frivolous. Mm -hmm. And yet it was, I mean, it was the center of so many scientific advancements. And that's, I mean, I think that's just really cool is it's cool to be able to find that story and tell it. Um, and it's what's special about this episode. And and I think that that's what's connects it to, to the next episode on asbestos is that they're both things that we, um, to some extent have very, have very clear concepts around them, connotations mm -hmm. and, their history kind of belies that connotation that we under as we understood it, mm -hmm. and I think that's an interesting an interesting thing to learn about. Absolutely, if you, intuitively you would have thought that we've known about helium forever; it's the second most abundant uh, element in the universe, and that asbestos was probably a relatively new thing. And intuitively, yeah. we think helium good and asbestos bad. And it turns out that uh, we've been using asbestos since ancient times, and we only identified helium in the 19th century and didn't really find usable amounts until we found it under Dexter, Kansas. Who'd have guessed that? And who'd have guessed the meaning behind that and th these are really two great episodes to contrast but also all the stuff that you learn about something you, you really didn't think had a story until you went and researched it and found out it does have a story and a compelling story i'll tell you what there's there are still many things that i'm sure i take for granted that are have stories that we have not told yet 
So I, I look forward to being able to do that. Sometimes I sit here and think, what's something that I take for granted that has a good story to it, that might have a good story to it, just to look, just to look it up. Yeah, we will, we'll keep doing that. I mean, what are you, what have we done? We've done dandelions and cats and, and yeah, all, you, you know, we lawnmowers and, and yeah. all incredibly yeah. interesting stories that who knew that they, that they had the histories yeah, that they knew. did. Yeah. Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Uh, you know, we sat down and we watched something called Great Bank Heists. And it was really fun, but you know what? I, I really want, I always have questioned the fact these were great bank heists, and there was one little thing that got them caught. What, it didn't make any difference. One used only, only amateur people except for the one, and he said a message wrong or that type of thing. But I want to know about the great bank heists that aren't there. I bet you there's a lot of them wandering around that have a bunch of money. <laughs> that got that away we, with it. <laughs> that, we did not, that we didn't see on Magellan on there. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things Magellan does is true crime. It's a lot of fun. These three bank heists that you see on the Great Bank Heist, they are as good as anything you've ever seen in a movie. They're plots as, you know, as the Italian job or Ocean's Eleven or any of that sort of thing. Uh, except that the only reason we know about them is that they messed up somewhere. And so I, w I, I won't spoil it any for, we won't spoil it for people any more than to say that the reason that these three are on here is because they did get caught. And that's how we found out the information about them. And it's almost as interesting how they got caught as it, how they, the, how they uh, got away with the original crime. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, you you can do all sorts of things on Magellan TV. I mean, we watch a lot of history on Magellan TV. Of course, this is, you know, true crime really is history. But uh, this is, you know, you, we just want to do something different. And, and this, this, it's really, this was as good as any heist movie you ever saw. Uh, but in the end, uh, they, all, they all wound up getting caught. So I'm interested, too. I wonder when we're going to see the one on the ones where they got away. Uh, and we might know a lot less about those because we didn't have, you know, you, you get a lot of information from these guys sitting in prison. They were actually interviewing some of these, some of these bank robbers in the, in the show. So it's one of those great, interesting, I mean, we just, we were on the edge of our seat the entire time uh, episodes on Magellan. Uh, what have you been watching? So I, I was on a very different note. I was looking at some more natural history stuff. And one that caught my eye was the, the mystery of the pink dolphin. And I think most people know the pink dolphin is this Amazon river dolphin. It's pink. It's also kind of a weird looking, a weird looking dolphin. But I, I kind of was interested in the idea of the mystery of it because I guess I wasn't really fully aware just what mystery surrounded it. But this kind of tells the story of what that mystery is. And dolphins, freshwater dolphins are very uncommon. There's only a, only a handful of species. They're they're fairly uncommon. And so it talked about it the research and how we even figured out what this dolphin was. After they had first seen it, it is pretty clearly a dolphin. It's got kind of like the bottle nose shape and it's, I mean, it's a mammal, but they weren't sure how, how this thing connected onto the, onto the family tree. And so this talks about how they figured out how it connected to the family tree and what its ancestors might've been for until very recently, we didn't know what uh, ancestors it had and where, what they could have been. But it's, it's a really interesting, it was a really interesting story about how these animals came to be and how they are currently existing they're they're endangered they're very they're very specialized for these particular the particular way that they live and so i thought that was just a really interesting story and another good place to see the just the breadth of information that's on magellan tv yeah whatever you, there's just so many different directions that you can go and they're all fascinating that one's fascinating too because there's there's history in natural history too because the history of how we discover and figure out what we know about those animals that is history of science too so it's if you are a lover of history any direction you go on documentaries whether those are space or true crime or, or natural history it's going to end up you know touching that 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 love for history that you have and i i don't think that anybody out there has more history content just straight up history content than magellan tv but i mean everything that we find on there it's a lot of fun and we find when we come and talk about these on the podcast that we often go a different direction than what we do in the channel because uh, because we have you know broader interest than that and it's always something to learn and some place to go. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of the History Guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com/historyguy, where we will always have a deal for you. Sometimes a free month, or a deal on an annual membership, or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com/historyguy. Next, the History Guy talks about the interesting and ancient history of a dangerous but incredibly useful substance, asbestos. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the History Guy. 
Today, asbestos is pretty much singularly known as something dangerous that used to be used in building materials. Billions of dollars are spent in asbestos abatement, and ads play on television offering legal help to people who've been exposed to asbestos. If you have an older home, you might worry about whether there's asbestos in your home. Uh, asbestos became so popular and used during the industrial era that we sometimes forget that it's not a new invention. It's a naturally occurring mineral, and one that has a surprisingly long history with humanity. Asbestos has been used in production for at least 4,000 years, and before it became known as a notorious killer, it had a very different reputation. The surprisingly long human relationship with asbestos is history that deserves to be remembered. Asbestos is an umbrella term that refers to six different naturally occurring silicate minerals composed of thin fibrous crystals. The fibers are made up of even smaller pieces called fibrils, which can be as small as a single micron in length. The most commonly used type is called chrysolite, or white asbestos, which makes up about 95% of the asbestos in most products, but a number of other kinds are recognized, including brown and blue asbestos. It functions naturally as an electric insulator. It is highly resistant to heat, it's chemically inert, and it strengthens other materials when mixed. In Greek, the substance we now call asbestos was originally called emiantos, meaning undefiled, because it showed no mark it was thrown into a fire. The Greek word asbestos actually referred to quicklime, but the Roman magistrate, Pliny the Elder, misused the word in his natural histories to refer to the incombustible material, which helped to popularize the name. In its modern use, the word asbestos was first used in the 1600s. Use of asbestos, however, goes back much further than that. 4,500 years ago, in East Finland, ancient people mixed asbestos into their clay, which strengthened the pots while allowing them to have thinner walls and adding heat resistance. The ancient Egyptians wrapped pharaohs in asbestos cloth to prevent deterioration. In Cyprus, ancient people made asbestos cremation cloths, hats, and shoes, and the island seemed to be a major source for the mineral. Greek historian Herodotus and Pliny both mention using asbestos cloths in cremations to wrap the body and keep the body's ashes separate from the fires. Pliny also says asbestos protected wares from spells, especially those of the Magi. Many cultures use asbestos to make napkins, tablecloths, and clothes. More than one writer made the same observation as the Greek historian Strabo, who said that these cloths were thrown into the fire and cleansed, just as linens are cleansed by washing. The fibers were also used as insulation for homes and ovens. Asbestos can be used to make candle wicks that don't burn away. One was used in the asbestos lynchinus, a golden lamp that, according to one traveler, only needed to be refilled once a year. The eternal flame cared for by the Roman Vestal Virgins may also have used an asbestos wick, and numerous writers say the elemental flame of the Athenian Acropolis had an asbestos wick. Even ancient writers recorded troubling things about asbestos. Both Pliny and Strabo mentioned that slaves that mined the mineral suffered from diseases of the lungs, and it was said that quarry slaves died young. Pliny called it a slave disease, and even described goat or lamb bladders being used as respirators. Despite these observations, they never really truly understood the risks of the mineral. Asbestos continued to be used throughout the world throughout the Middle Ages, though it seems to have declined somewhat. Charlemagne, first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was said to have had an asbestos tablecloth that he impressed dinner guests with by tossing it into the fire at the end of the meal. Medieval monks on Cyprus used asbestos in their paint, adding a mirror-like sheen to their paintings. This substance was rare enough for traveling salesmen to make asbestos crosses they claimed were blessed when they didn't burn. It's also used as insulation in the armor of some knights and crusaders in the 11th century are said to have filled asbestos bags with burning tar to fire out of trebuchet. In Asia, the Han Dynasty general Long Qi was said to have a suit of asbestos cloth that he would wear to special occasions. He would refuse tea until it was spilled on him, and then, feigning anger, have the clothes thrown into the fire where they would come out clean. In the same period, asbestos became associated with something unexpected, the salamander. The salamander was poorly understood in antiquity, but it had for centuries had a connection with fire. Some medieval alchemists even declared the salamander a fire elemental. As early as the 4th century BC, Aristotle connected the amphibian with fire, and Pliny said the creatures were so cold they could extinguish fire. The Jewish Talmud also mentions the salamander, claiming it is a product of fire. The Greeks and Romans detailed the mining of asbestos, but by the Middle Ages, society seems to have forgotten its origins. Apparently novel to Middle-aged thinkers was the idea that asbestos was actually the fur of a salamander, and was called salamander wool. Arab scholars more often thought it was the cut feathers of an exotic bird, while some Chinese authors described a kind of rodent that lived in volcanoes.
British polymath Sir Thomas Brown later suggested that asbestos has taken on the metaphorical name of salamander wool, but that the people started to take them too literally. In the 13th century, Marco Polo learned of asbestos mining in Asia, and he wrote that the real truth is that the salamander is no beast, as they allege in our part of the world, but is a substance found in the earth. Still, the myth of the salamander persisted. Even Leonardo da Vinci thought that the salamander had no internal organs and survived off fire alone. In the early modern period, scientists turned to the utility of asbestos. Research into the material exploded starting in the 17th century. By 1700, the Royal Society had published eight reviews and letters on the mineral, and in 1727, the first full volume on asbestos was published, followed quickly by two others. New applications seemed to appear every day. Italians made asbestos paper and later asbestos banknotes, and fireproof gloves, capes, and clothes appeared in the traveling show of the human salamanders, who were known for cooking a steak while standing in a bonfire. Benjamin Franklin carried an asbestos coin purse with him in his youth so that the money would never burn a hole in his pocket. He sold it in 1724 to the eventual benefactor of the British Museum. Giovanni Aldini, known for his experiments using electricity to move the muscles of cadavers, invented a line of fireproof clothing for firefighters in the early 1800s, which became popular in places like Paris and Geneva. Asbestos stage curtains were credited with saving lives in theater fires, and others suggested making an indestructible book of eternity of asbestos paper. Possibly the most important use for asbestos were in construction. Mixing with rubber created a fire-resistant compound that allowed far more resilient steam gaskets, vitally important in advancing steam engines and boilers. In the 1860s, Henry Ward Johns created an asbestos tar paper for roofs, which could protect buildings from fire. It was this invention that began to truly open markets for the product. Austrian Ludwig Hatzchek created fire-resistant building panels that could be both thinner and stronger, which led to hundreds of products based on his invention, including asbestos tiles, corrugated panels, and ceiling moldings. The fireproof material caused a sensation and was hailed as a miracle mineral that could save thousands of lives in an era that lived in fear of building fires. Asbestos was perfect for the industrial age. It was versatile and easily added to other materials. It was mixed into cement and wood to create fireproof ships and included in all kinds of plastic items for increased strength and as a binder. It would become a staple of the flooring industry in vinyl asbestos tile. It was widely used as insulation on pipes, water heaters, and engines, especially in trains and ships, which used the product extensively. It was even used to make juice filters and breathing apparatuses. As demand grew, production had to match it. The first industrial asbestos mine was opened in the Thetford Hills of Quebec in the late 1870s, and thriving industries also blossomed in Germany, England, South Africa, Australia, and Finland. It quickly became mechanized, and by 1900 there were more than 30,000 tons being produced annually. Henry Ward John's company invented more asbestos construction products, but John's himself would die in 1898, probably of asbestosis. The company would merge with the Manville Company to become one of the biggest players in the industry, John's Manville, in 1901. It was in the late 1800s and early 1900s that medical professionals started to notice health issues connected to asbestos. In 1897, a doctor in Austria attributed patients' breathing problems to breathing asbestos, and an 1898 report by the British government cited widespread damage and injury of the lungs due to the dusting surrounding of the asbestos mill. The first confirmed death from asbestosis was reported in England in 1906 by Dr. Montague Murray. Murray performed an autopsy on a 33-year-old patient and found large amounts of asbestos fibers in his lungs. Across Europe, other reports of deaths from fibrosis were reported. Insurance companies were aware of the dangers too, and as early as 1908, they decreased coverage and increased premiums for workers in the factories that used asbestos. Asbestosis is the damage caused to the lungs by tiny asbestos fibers. The scarring within the lungs hinders oxygen from being transferred to the blood. It can take time for the symptoms to present because lungs have a kind of excess capacity, but once this excess is gone, the symptoms grow worse very quickly. Before it was understood, the symptoms were often missed because it was often seen in conjunction with tuberculosis and pneumonia. In 1924, the death of Nellie Kershaw, who had worked spinning asbestos into yarn, led to an inquest in which the pathologist Edmund Cook identified minerals found in Kershaw's lungs as the primary cause of the fibrosis of the lungs and, therefore, of death. Because of these and other cases, Edward Rowland Allworth Merriweather decided to study asbestos workers in textile factories. With the help of C.W. Price, an industrial engineer and pioneer of dust monitoring, Merriweather put the dangers of asbestos into the greatest context yet. A full quarter of the workers were suffering from asbestosis, 
and those who had worked longer were sicker. The report underlined the seriousness of the disease, and within a year, legislation was passed in the UK to make efforts to reduce asbestos dust and require medical screenings for employees. Merriweather felt that the study meant asbestos workers faced inevitable death. The study was published simultaneously in the United States and became the most prominent study proving the danger of asbestos. In 1933, Johns Manville confidently settled 11 claims from workers seeking disability due to lung damage. Thousands more would be brought against asbestos companies in the 1920s. The companies were not blind to the danger. They began sponsoring much of the research into the risk, especially through the Sarnac Laboratory in upstate New York. The industry expected to control the outcomes, as one sponsor explained. It's our further understanding that the results obtained will be considered the property of those advancing the required funds. This enabled them to suppress some of the results of a 1940 study where 81% of lab mice exposed to asbestos dust developed lung cancer. The warning signs couldn't slow the industry. Production tripled between 1900 and 1910, and in the late 1930s, asbestos was already massively popular. In 1939, the Johns Manville Company built an asbestos man, protecting mankind's buildings for display at that year's World's Fair. The growing tensions of World War II caused countries to stockpile asbestos for fear of disruptions in production. In the U.S., asbestos was used in almost every facet of the war effort. Bazookas, jeep engines, torpedoes, and ship engines all used asbestos. Even army medics carried it as an easily sterilized dressing. Use in American shipyards led to high rates of lung cancer and mesothelioma in shipbuilders. U.S. asbestos consumption grew astronomically during the war. In 1942, the U.S. was consuming 60% of the world's production, up from 37% just five years earlier. In 1949, Merriweather again broke ground with his annual report by the Chief Inspector of Factories for 1947, which showed that victims of asbestosis were much more likely to develop cancers of the lung or lung lining than victims of silicosis in the general population. The results were anonymously published shortly after in America, proving that the connection between lung cancers and asbestos. The first physician to make the connection was actually the German H. W. Wedler in 1943, but the ongoing war meant his research was ignored. Meanwhile, the use of asbestos in the United States actually reached its peak in the post-war years. In Europe and Japan, asbestos was used widely in the construction necessary to rebuild war-torn nations. While in the U.S., the practical uses of asbestos meant it became an integral part of thousands of products. Put into brake pads in cars and elevators, used in hair dryers, air conditioners, electric insulation, fake snow, including that used on the set of The Wizard of Oz, surgical thread, irons in the filters of Kent Micronite cigarettes, and even as an abrasive in toothpaste. But the consensus that the product was dangerous continued to grow. Multiple reports connected to occurrences of several kinds of cancers. And in 1964, Dr. Irving Selikoff presented findings that deaths at a New Jersey asbestos factory were 25% higher than would be expected statistically. Still, in the U.S., the powerful asbestos companies worked hard to downplay the risk. The peak of asbestos consumption in the U.S. was reached in 1973. By the 1960s, growing understanding that even small amounts of exposure could cause serious health effects finally began to take a toll on public opinion. The Environmental Protection Agency, created in 1970, became the Crusader. In 1973, it banned spray-on asbestos for insulating and fireproofing purposes. The 70s would also see them ban asbestos in cement pipes, artificial fire embers, and wall-patching compounds. In the 80s, it required schools to document asbestos and remove it if dangerous to protect children and teachers, though the cost of abatement was sometimes prohibitive. In 1989, the EPA created the Ban and Phase-Out Rule, which would have eventually led to a complete ban of asbestos-containing material. The Phase-Out Rule, however, failed to pass a clause in the Toxic Substances Control Act that required the EPA to find the least burdensome means to accomplish the task. It was overturned in 1991. The 1989 Act did ban any new uses of asbestos. Today, 55 nations have banned asbestos entirely, but it's still not entirely banned in Canada and the United States, where it can still appear in some products. It's actually most popular in the third world, where the market's growing and regulation is lax. The last asbestos mine in the United States closed in 2003, the last one in Canada in 2011. And still, the legacy of asbestos exposure looms large, where an estimated quarter million people a year die from complications due to asbestos exposure, mostly from cancers like mesothelioma. And what was once touted as the miracle mineral that could solve almost any problem has now become the enemy. 
largest bestest manufacturers like Johns Mansville and Turner and Newell have fallen apart in the face of asbestos litigation. Through the course of that litigation we find out that they probably knew more than anybody about the risk of asbestos and hid much of that knowledge in order to protect their profits. Still, despite its risks, asbestos traces a long thread through the course of human history. So this is uh, just like the helium one. This ends up being such an interesting story. When I first looked into it, and I think what, what I wrote this script, and I think part of what got me into it was the idea that we were apparently using asbestos 4,500 years ago. They found it in pottery in Finland. And that's, I mean, that's amazing. And they were using it for the exact same reasons that we ended up using it so, so much later is that it, it can be used to strengthen things. So they could make a thinner pottery, but mm -hmm. with the asbestos, it was stronger. Uh, that's, an, that's an amazing story to me. And it was one that I had not not even considered imagining. I had I wasn't really sure what asbestos was, to be fully honest. Um, but I, I knew it was some kind of uh, something that was fibrous and that got right. into dust. But the I didn't know what kind of material it was, or that apparently it's completely natural. So, well, and yeah, you just find it and and uh, you core it and and a stone that's a fiber. You can actually see how you know you would have started using that to to do all sorts of things. Yeah. And it just wasn't something, it wasn't something I'd given a whole lot of thought about. Yeah, and so it was either. just interesting to, to look at. But the history, the history really ended up being, being the story that was worth telling. It's deeply interesting to me that, and this is maybe the most fun part of the episode. It's one of those things that I, I'll bring up if I've got something funny to bring up at a party. Uh, <laughs> the, that asbestos was not connected to minerals, even though the, the ancient Greeks had been like, ah, yes, this is a mineral. We dug it up. We had supplies of it. They knew what it was. By the Middle Ages, apparently we had kind of forgotten what it was as a, as a group because all over the world, they weren't sure what it was mm -hmm. and so that was one of the connections that i that i did not know was why a salamander is connected to fire i never really understood that that's something we got to explore in this because they started calling it salamander's wool but then you have this connection also to since this asbestos is fireproof that maybe that's that maybe it came from a salamander and honestly who knew who knew? Who knew that two were connected? We're connecting different legends, and you know the salamander legend has a lot to do with uh, Christian theology too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then those, and that tries to explain something in the natural world. It's not a surprise, but uh, when you when you put it all together, but it's not something anybody I think would have expected. Yeah, and it's it's fast. And again, uh, the history of it makes it so fascinating. It makes quite a story out of something that you know. That right now, the only problem is if you're you know rebuilding the middle school, you have to. You have to get all this, the asbestos out of there. That's all we think of with asbestos now. Uh, and, you know, remediation and, and to understand yeah. it has that long history. And at some point, this was so remarkable uh, that it became part of th that sort of legend is, is really extraordinary. It's one of those fun stories to tell. Well, and something that generally wealthy people had. And that even in the ancient times, they had kind of, they had started to notice connections between asbestos and disease mm -hmm. uh, people they, they would say that the quarry workers you know were they died young and while they never really made the connection of that's because of the asbestos or and certainly not to the level of why that was causative um but i i also think that one of the if anyone today knows what a salamander is at least basically and to to imagine that you must not have known much about a salamander if you thought it had wool <laughs> <laughs> and there were a couple of other ones like the the muslim world generally thought that it, okay, it was some kind of feather um and there was a chinese legend that it was some kind of lava dwelling rodent <laughs> well i mean that rock is not supposed to look like that they're trying to you're trying yeah. to explain why do you have something that has these properties of stone and of of cloth and that's the answer is that you come to it. And then, of course, how we yeah. come to understand that, uh, you know, in the modern age is, is, is story itself, too. And so, again, this is one of those really surprising but just fascinating stories. It really is a very strange looking mineral. Yes. It's because it, 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 it really just does look it looks like wool. I understand why maybe you're not thinking, ah, we probably dug that out of a out of a mine someplace. But Marco Polo being like, ah, well, in Europe, they think that this comes from an animal. But no, <laughs> it's a rock. But apparently China may have had some some parts of in those far eastern areas that were mining it at the time uh, might have had some interest in making sure that no one else figured out that they could dig it up because that made it very valuable. It's part of the history as well. And then, of course, the modern history of it, which I think is something I, I wasn't alive for the by the time I was born, asbestos was bad. But in the, it's amazing that into the 20th century and in the, the 19th century as well that, I mean, they put this stuff in everything. 
I, I one of the things that really shocked me is it was in toothpaste. Yeah, who knew? Yeah, I mean, when you had these things that you thought were miracle products, then uh, then they would put it in anything because you could advertise that people with. I mean, you know, there was, there was magnets in everything and lead in everything and uh, cocaine in everything and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, once you once you've identified or you know, uh, radium in everything too. And yeah. Once you identify it as a miracle product, then there's always someone that's going to go and sell that. Uh, but then, you know, well after we understand that there are health risks of it, I mean, we continue using this stuff. And, you know, there, there's a lot of advantage to that. I mean, fireproofing meant a lot. I mean, there's a reason it's in schools. There's a reason it's in Navy ships. Uh, but then that means that, uh, that dangers of it become that much worse, too. And now it seems yeah. like any time you tear down an old building, it ends up costing three times as much as you thought because you end up discovering that there's asbestos in there somewhere. Yeah, my, my wife uh, works at a college here and there was damage to the to the server room and they have been unable to, the stuff still hasn't returned because since there was a fire and some water damage, now they have to remediate the whole building, uh, which it's full of asbestos because it was built when everything was full of asbestos. Hmm. And it is it is really amazing that for, for something that has taken on such a negative connotation that to some extent uh, it had earned its its position as a as a miracle mineral i really was used in everything and i don't know that it was all that useful in toothpaste i think they were trying to use it as an abrasive um <laughs> i just stabbing yourself with uh, asbestos fibers doesn't seem wise to me but at the time maybe well well some people seem to that's that's one of the stories here too is that we we kind of figured out it was bad for everybody and the asbestos companies knew it and they were just kind of like now there's money to make here so let's part of the story <laughs> and i mean there's industrial history is part of history too and we find other examples of that too where there's uh, you know that's that's part of history too and uh, we try to tell any kind of history at the history guy and i hope we tell it on, on varnish we try to tell it without a, an agenda uh, but it's you know it's a real fact that, that not only were we using asbestos everywhere when that wasn't a good idea but we continued using it when some people knew it wasn't a good idea but also knew that they were still going to be making a profit off of it and that's that's part of the story as well and in many ways as interesting as the story of the medieval people thinking that it came off a salamander or the fact that it was used yeah. by the greeks and that's why asbestos is a compelling story these days it's those mesothelioma commercials that you really see it in because they used them in so many industries we had a lot of stories on the comments of that video of people talking about working in the shipbuilding industry because mm -hmm. it was used so widely and they they would talk about the you know the docks just being smoky with asbestos fibers and it took us the history of us figuring out that it was that asbestos was the was what was killing us uh was was an interesting is an interesting story too because that took a lot of time because because of the damage it was doing to the lungs there was you know sudden sudden onset of severe symptoms and it was causing such damage that they usually weren't dying you know of fibrosis they were dying of pneumonia or tuberculosis but those were brought on directly because they were getting stabbed by all this by the fibers in their lungs yeah yeah and that, that's a, it's an interesting story and it's something that i think some people understand but it's easy to forget mm -hmm. and you know history simply does have tragedy to it i mean that's it's part yeah. of history and so it's uh, uh, yes a newer generation might have forgotten what what the sacrifices that occurred because of uh, that generation it's something that we need to remember because uh, who knows what might be the next asbestos yeah stuff that well it's there's just there is some truth to say that when you find something that's so useful uh that it resists the, the desire to just get rid of it. And it really was, I mean, we haven't found some of the stuff that it was able to do, we haven't found replacements that were as effective at it. But, you know, we don't want our children to be ex expo exposed to it. But it's interesting, because, you know, we, we treat it so, so carefully now that, you know, if there's a broken tile, they're like, ah, oh, that's asbestos, it's horrible. Um, and they have to remediate and everything like that. When it's the, the truth is, you know, one tile might not necessarily be so dangerous. And I think that we need to understand what the dangers are, too, as opposed to just it's mm -hmm. scary. Well, I mean, there's asbestos in the liner of a M1917 helmet, and so because that, we're not supposed to take it to say show and tell. Now, I don't think we're probably going to give kids cancer, but it's probably a good yeah. idea not bring it into the school when we spent probably a million dollars to get it out of the school. But uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it's built in everything, so it's in some of the artifacts that I have in my office, and you and you have to be careful with those. Yeah, it's easily well, and it's probably most people uh, have been in buildings that are filled with asbestos, the tile and the, the, uh, they started using it and, uh, every kind of walling and roofing and pretty much anything you could think of. It really was incredible. They, well, they, it was one fire of those. Is bad. You know, you don't, you don't want fire. So are you, you want to know where your fire is? Uh, so, I mean, it made sense. Uh, it seemed a thing to do at the time. 
Well, you know, it did seem like a miracle where they were like, oh my gosh, we could build something out of this material. And if that guy's house catches on fire, it won't burn down the whole city. <laughs> That's, I mean, that was a, that was significant. I, you look at some of those fires and especially, you know, like the great fires in London and stuff like that. There was real reason to be happy that we had an ability yeah. to fight fire. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.